Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Welcome to uh, day two of the Psychology 241 lectures. See, we've got a pretty good crowd here on the chat bar already. Looks like we got 14 people. Welcome. It's good to see everybody. I'm sitting here in the frozen tundra of South Campus. I think they must have turned the uh, uh, heat completely off because it has been freezing all morning long. Holy cow. Um, so uh, somebody in the 11 o'clock class asked about why no hat. It's because I combed my hair today. My hair is looking better so I could go without a hat today. So that's what I'm doing that for. Hi, Bree. Hi, uh, Leanne. Hello, everybody. You know what? I've actually got a heater in between my legs sitting right here underneath my desk. It's the only way I've managed to survive today. Holy cow, it's cold in this joint. I know the hat looks snazzy, and uh, maybe I'll wear it next week. Speaking of next week, um, next Monday is, uh, there are going to be some changes to the lecture next week. Next Monday is a holiday, a school holiday. It is Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. So we are moving the lecture from Monday to Tuesday. And also, I had a problem with a doctor's appointment uh, for next uh, Tuesday, so uh, so they 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 moved it to Wednesday. So I'm moving next week's third to Wednesday lecture to Thursday. Bottom line: instead of Monday and Wednesday next week, we will be meeting Tuesday and Thursday at 1 p.m. I am so sorry for the inconvenience, and I've been promised by the doctor's office that they will not move any more of my meetings. So does ever it'll be at the same time, Etta? but it will be at 1 o'clock. And I know that's probably going to inconvenience at least one of you, and I am so sorry. There's absolutely nothing I can do about that. But I made the doctors promise me that there will be... Uh, no, the webinar will still occur on Wednesday night because the doctor's appointments will be all done. So I can still meet you next Wednesday. That's a great question, Jungian. Uh We will still do the webinar next Wednesday at 8 p.m. Speaking of the webinar, we are doing the webinar... Uh, this evening at uh, 8 p.m. in Microsoft Teams. It won't be on YouTube. It'll be in Microsoft Teams. And I'll send you a reminder later this afternoon so you don't forget. But we're going to be talking about <laughs> we're going to be talking about cohort effects and what it means to grow up in the COVID generation. Um, and I'm going to talk about what it means to grow up in in the 80s. I'm a kid of the 70s and 80s. So we're going to be talking about longitudinal study designs and cohorts uh, this this evening. So I do hope uh, I do hope you uh, come to the webinar tonight. Remember, if you're going to come to the webinar, I have a couple of short videos that I want you to watch before you get there, so you come prepared. Remember, I'm not going to be very interested in seeing you there if you're not prepared uh, to talk, uh, if you haven't watched the videos and aren't prepared to talk. I'm going to do all the talking today, but tonight I want you folks to do some of the talking too. Hopefully, it'd be best if you do most of the talking. And Ashley Guthrie is already getting fired up about the Wednesday night webinar. Ashley's a, a famous uh, uh, Tuesday night uh, attendee from last semester, and she leads the party, so I am looking forward to having her. Um, and you know what? I would like to say hello to Tara Solomon, a student from last semester who is uh, creeping in on our lecture for a few minutes today. Hello, Tara. Tara, welcome to uh, welcome to uh, the webinar. This is the developmental psych class. Hopefully, uh, Tara, I'll see you in a future semester in my 241 class. Um, nice, and Etta's got some wicked weed. Uh, she went to the Wicked Weed Brewery uh, in, um, in, uh, in Asheville, so she doesn't have that kind of weed. She's got the Wicked Weed Beer. <laughs> no, Doug, it's not that kind of Wicked Weed. Uh, you folks are hilarious, though. It's good to see everybody. Wow, looks like we got 21. Almost half the class is in here today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It is great to see every one of you today. Thanks for choosing to come to the live lecture. Remember, if you ever can't make the live lecture, you are more than welcome to click on the link and watch the lecture as a recording. So for some of you, you might want to open up your homework, watch the lecture as a recording, and go through and try to do your homework as I talk. 
Um, so I'd love to see you live, but I definitely want to see you recorded too. All right, without further ado, let's go ahead and get in today's lecture. We're going to be talking about the second half of chapter one today, Introduction to the Lifespan Perspective. So what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about the different theoretical perspectives that we're going to be approaching human development from uh, this semester. We're going to talk about the basic features of each of these theoretical perspectives that are described in chapter one that will occur over the course of this semester. And then we're going to talk a little bit about time span research methods. In developmental psychology, we measure how people change over time. So experiments and case studies aren't always the most appropriate way to do developmental research. So we're going to talk about time span research methods, OK? Fantastic. Let's see. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let's talk a little bit. Now, in this uh, uh, first chapter, they identify different theories of development, theoretical perspectives that we're going to be using this semester. And there are probably half a dozen of these different, uh, excuse me, five of these different theoretical dis perspectives that we're going to be keep, we're going to keep revisiting each week in our class. So we're going to be talking about different ways of conceptualizing the human being over the course of the semester. And I wanted to introduce them to you today. Now, why do we need a theory? Theories are very important because they help organize the science that we do. An experiment, a case study, a correlation is nothing but an observation. A theory, on the other hand, is a set of interrelated postulates that explain and organize a set of observations. So science needs theories. Otherwise, we're left with just a bunch of observations that don't help us really learn anything. Let me give you a quick example that's not talked about in your book. Uh, this fellow named uh, Sir Isaac Newton made this really cool observation, uh, supposedly, if you believe the legend. He was sitting under an apple tree, and an apple fell and hit him right in the head. That's an observation. Wow, this apple fell from up there to down here. Now, I'll give you another observation. I'm a baseball player, and I love baseball. And what I found is that if you throw a baseball up high in the sky, it will go so high, but then it won't stay there. It will fall back to Earth, too. So we've got two observations. Apple falls from trees, and balls that are thrown up tend to fall down. Now, those are just two observations. And you might say, how are they related to one another? Well, that's the thing. We need a theory to help us understand how these two observations are related. And so this guy, Sir Isaac Newton, came up with the theory of gravity. And what he suggested is we can think about how we can understand these organizations if we understand that every object or mass in the universe attracts, has a pull on other objects in the universe. And a big object pulls a smaller object towards it. And he said, the Earth is a really big object, and an apple is a small object. So when a small object's up there, it gets pulled towards the Earth. And when you throw a ball away from the Earth, the Earth, a bigger object, pulls that smaller baseball back down to Earth. So he came up with a theory, and that theory helps us to understand what the similarity is between these two observations. So... This theory of gravity explains why we have these two different observations that seem to show the same thing. And so it organizes a set of observations. Now, not only does a theory organize the observations that we have, but a theory suggests further experiments that we can use. So, for example, when we're talking about planetary science and we wonder why, uh, why meteors fall to the ground, we can begin to imagine that meteors are smaller objects that fly by the Earth, and they get caught in the gravitational force of the Earth, and it pulls them right down to the Earth. And then we can even use that to expand our understanding of the sky and understand why smaller objects uh, 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 go around bigger objects. So we can ex use the theory of gravity to understand why the Earth circles around the sun. So hopefully that makes sense to you. A theory is very important because that suggests how a bunch of observations are related and it gives us uh, the knowledge to uh, suggest other hypotheses. How many of you in science class 
uh, learn the definition of a hypothesis. And had you had a teacher tell you that a hypothesis is an educated guess. Anybody ever heard that term before? An educated guess? Absolutely. Well, what your teacher didn't tell you was a, an educated guess means that it's educated because it comes from a theory which suggests why we should have that hypothesis. So theories are very, very important for helping us develop hypotheses. And now you know that a hypothesis is educated by a theory. It's not just a guess in the dark. It is actually educated because it comes from a theoretical explanation. So if I take my coffee cup right here and decide that I'm going to throw my coffee cup up in the air, I can have the very realistic observation that I am probably going to be drenched by hot coffee, right? Because my hypothesis is educated by the theory of, of gravity. Okay, so that's the general statement of why theories are valuable. Now, there are lots of different theoretical traditions in psychology. Um, and in fact, the list that you see down below you are not even all of the different theoretical uh, orientations and traditions that we have in psychology. But these are the major theoretical traditions that we will discuss this semester. There's what we call the psychodynamic, or if you're a Freudian psychologist, the psychoanalytic perspective. Or tradition. There's the cognitive tradition, and those of you who are in my class semester heard me talk about the cognitive tradition ad nauseum. Uh, there's the behavioral tradition. Those of you from my class last semester will remember me talking a lot about the behavioral tradition. There's the ethological tradition, and there's also the ecological tradition. Absolutely, yes. Uh, Leanne, the sex guy. And you're right, Etta, uh, I don't want a uh, coffee bath. I'd rather have coffee in my mouth than on top of my head. Ooh, ooh, Davina. Listen to Davina. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant question. Holy cow, Davina. That is a deep question. And I want to go ahead and give you two thumbs up for being clever enough to ask that question. Sometimes an observation is so unexplained and doesn't fit with other theories that we even have to uh, we even have to create a new theoretical tradition, and I can actually if you want to uh, I'm not even going to talk about that philosopher, but you know what? Sometimes an observation is so hard to figure out that we have to create an entire new theory, theoretical tradition to develop it. And that's why people like Sigmund Freud, uh, um, Leanne just mentioned Sigmund Freud, he is the guy who came up with the psychodynamic theory. Very good question. A fellow named John Watson was the first guy who came up with the behavioral uh, tradition as well. Um, a guy named Conrad Lorenz was the first of many people to talk about the ethological theoretical tradition. Fantastic. So you, Davina, or you, Jungin, or you, any of you may be the person who has observations that are so wild and don't fit with other theories, you may be the person to create your own theory. And that's why Sigmund Freud, John Watson, and Conrad Lorenz are especially important in science because they were the ones they were the people who realized that sometimes we needed a whole new theory. Very good question. Wow, I'm very impressed, very impressed. So what I'm going to do quickly is I'm going to go over the major features of each of these five traditions. And I want you to know that over the course of the semester, I'm going to come back and talk about them. So whenever we're talking about socio-emotional development, I'm going to talk about the psychodynamic tradition and sometimes the ethological tradition. When I talk about... Uh, uh, and I might even talk about the behavioral tradition. When I'm talking about cognitive development, I'm specifically talking about the cognitive tradition, or I may even be talking about the ecological tradition. So we're going to revisit each of these traditions multiple times over the course of this semester. Any questions so far? I hope everybody understands what I'm talking about. Sometimes when I'm looking at a camera, I don't know if I'm making any sense. I make sense to myself, but sometimes I talk to my wife and she's like, Chris, you're not making any sense to me. Okay, good enough. So Leanne says we got it. I hope everybody agrees with Leanne. 
Now let's first talk about the uh, psychodynamic perspective. Now you'll notice I'm using psychodynamic and psychoanalytic theory interchangeably here. The first theory uh, developed by Sigmund Freud, he called it psychoanalytic. All right. Now, uh, and he had his theory and he argued that human beings are, are, are developed based on internal drives. He called it the sexual drive. And the conflict occurs, uh, develops when this sexual drive, which is biological, um, meets the rules of society. So we all have sexual impulses. But we can't always express those sexual impulses because there are rules about how we do that. You folks know that you would get in big time trouble if you went down to the mall and had sex in the middle of the mall, right? Your biology would run in conflict with the rules of society and you'd get in trouble. So he argued that our internal drive runs into conflict and it's this conflict that creates personality, if you will. Is everybody having a blurry stream here? I'm sorry, I just saw Edda's comment. Now, um, most the psychodynamic perspective, and we're going to talk mainly about two guys. We're going to talk about Eric Erickson, who you see pictured right below me, and we're going to talk about Sigmund Freud. They are both psychodynamic psychologists because they both argue that conflict is the most important part of personality development. But Freud was specific because he said the conflict was sexual in nature. And so if you say psychoanalytic, you mean Freud only. If you say psychodynamic, you mean Freud or Horneye or Eric Erickson or Alfred Adler. All of those people believed in intrapsychic conflict, but only Freud in psychoanalysis believes that that conflict comes from sexual instincts. I hope that makes sense. So according to Freud, he argued that we have this sexual desire called libido, and it's the motivation behind all our human behavior. Why do you get up in the morning? Why do you walk? Why do you talk? Why do you uh, move around? He argues because we're all looking somehow or another to express this libidinal energy. Now, he argued that this desire is housed in our animal part of our brain, so I don't even think about sex. I just feel it. It's this pressure that builds up in my body. And he argues that that sort of exists in sort of this animalistic part of your brain called the id. Now, your rules often come into conflict. Uh, your desires also come into conflict with the rules of society. And because this happens, we get embarrassed about our sexual feelings. And he argues that this sexual embarrassment creates what you and I would call a conscience and what Freud called a superego. And he argued that the superego and the id are always fighting against one another. Your, your id wants to have sex and your superego is saying, uh-uh-uh, that's bad and that's wrong. He definitely was uh, obsessed with sex. But you know what, Etta? If you think about it, if you were going to build an organism and wanted to make sure that that organism survived from generation to generation, you would have to build the sexual instinct as a strong part of that animal, right? Because if animals don't want to have sex, you can't have sexual reproduction. So it kind of makes sense in that way. And he argues that this sexual drive meets up against the rules and it causes conflict. Now, he argued that our personality develops as a function of trying to manage these two competing desires. I want to have sex. I'm embarrassed about sex. I want to have sex. I'm embarrassed about sex. He argues that our ego is our conscious personality, and our ego's job is to make both of these sides happy, to give us sex when we can get it, while not getting in trouble or feeling embarrassed about those sexual impulses. And so he developed this whole theory based on internal drives and the conflict that it causes when we have to manage our behavior in society. Okay? Now, the guy we're going to talk about more commonly is a fellow named Eric Erickson. And he, he developed what he called ego psychology. Now, Freud thought that our conflict occurred below our level of awareness. I'm driven by desires I don't even understand. But Eric Erickson was more interested in how people develop their identity. And anybody ever heard the term uh, identity crisis? Anybody ever heard the term identity crisis? 
You know what? And Edda brings up a good point. He developed his theory in 19th century Europe. And 19th century Europe was a very, very uptight and sexually repressed place. I don't know if you went to, uh, went to the um, Biltmore House, Edda, when you were in Asheville this week. But what they told us was that they had a, a men's bedroom. Even uh, married couples slept in separate, separate bedrooms because they didn't want the servants to see the male or the female in their underclothes. And so back then, in, if you were rich enough, you had different bedrooms for the guys and the girls, even if they were married. And this was all because they were very, very sexually repressed. Okay, so Stephanie's heard of the term ego crisis. Uh, uh, an, an identity crisis. Now, that is a term that Eric Erickson coined, and he coined it to describe that difficult process that all of us have in our teenage years when we're trying to go from being our parents' uh, kids to our own identity, our own person. And Leanne, I know you, and I'm not picking on you, but I know you're about the appropriate age. You're this college age student who's trying to grow up right now. And I'll bet you, just like me, Leanne, you probably sometimes feel conflict. Who am I? Who am I sexually? Who am I politically? Who am I in terms of a career or a job? You probably are even having trouble picking what major you might want to be in. Leanne, you are going through a normal part of development that he would call the identity crisis period. And so what he argued was that human beings go through eight different crises, psychological tasks, that occur during various times of your life. Once you move into your late 20s, your crisis is going to be on finding love or a relationship, right? And then when you're my age, your crisis is figuring out whether or not you can be a person who gives back to the next generation. And so according, yeah, right? Well, oh, good point, Didi. You're still 30 plus and you still go through this. The cool thing about Eric Erickson, he said these crises typically happen at certain times, but you can even go back and revisit a crisis later. So for example, if you were to get fired from your career or get divorced when you're in your 40s, you might have to go back and have that identity crisis all over again. So I'm going to continue. Uh, I'm 37 and I still have, you know, actually, good point. Really, you spend your whole adult life trying to manage your identity. And you wake up every day asking yourself, who am I? And, you know, I'm a little bit older, so I feel a little more confident about my identity. But it's because I'm married and I've had this career for 25 years. But if one of those things gave out on me, if my wife got up and said, Chris, you're an asshole, which I am, and left me, or I got fired from my job, uh, I might have to go back through that identity crisis period. And so what we're going to do this semester, we're not going to talk about Freud so much, but we are going to talk about Eric Erickson and the psychodynamic perspective. Every time we get to a socio-emotional development chapter, we're going to talk about Eric Erickson again. Does that make sense? Oh, that's awfully nice of you, Leanne. You just don't know me well enough. I promise I can bring it out when necessary. Exactly. Who am I and what am I doing? You know, exactly. And what Eric Erickson argued was that the more complex the world is, the harder it is for us to fit into the fabric of life. He actually did all of he did his most important research with the Oglala Sioux located out in, uh, I believe it was Oklahoma. Um, he And these uh, Oglala Sioux had been moved to a reservation and their way of life had been snatched away from them and they were told to become European in their culture. And the thing was, he found that a lot of these uh, Sioux, uh, the Indian, who, the Indians uh, were having difficulty because in their old culture, everybody had a place and you knew where you fit in with society. But since they were transitioning to a European society, they were suffering lots of identity problems because they didn't know how to fit themselves into this new society that they were forced to into. Okay, we're going to visit uh, the psychodynamic perspective over the course of this semester. And I invite you to ask yourself, um, as we go over these different crises, do you remember when it happened to you? How did you feel? And how did you resolve the crisis that you felt? Okay. Second uh, theory is the cognitive theories. And if you remember, we uh, in intro psych, we talked about cognitive psychology, and that's about thinking, attention, 
memory. Now, uh, we're going to talk about two classic cognitive theories, uh, one developed by Jean Piaget and one developed uh, who was a Swiss psychologist, and one developed by Lev Vygotsky, a Russian psychologist. And these are what we call classic cognitive theories. And I'm going to contrast them with the new uh, cognitive perspective called the information processing approach, which is what I focused on in introductory psychology. All right. Now, Piaget and Vygotsky were interested, you know, Davina, uh, and I'm just going to stop and, and relate to Davina's point. Yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, 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 <laughs> it's unfortunately been one of our, uh, uh, one of our cultural uh, uh, outcomes is that uh, especially European white Americans have tried to fit everybody else into their culture. And we sort of believe that our culture is the best. And sometimes we've uh, pushed other people to sort of fit into our culture and we've judged them when they don't. That's a great point. Davina, you've made a couple of good points today. Remind me to give you a gold star in the grade book somewhere, okay? Now, uh, exactly. Etta, gold star for Etta, too. And a gold star for Leanne. All of you are really engaged in making some good points today. Piaget and Vygotsky were interested in how human beings develop their minds. How do we go from a baby, which doesn't really seem to demonstrate any mental abilities, to the beautiful, intelligent people that are sitting here in front of me. In Piaget's theory of cognitive development, um, he argued that human beings are born with these instinctual behaviors. Okay, we're born with instincts. And because these instincts have outcomes, we begin to notice these outcomes, and we develop cognitive structures he called schemes. And he argued that these schemes become more complex as we get older, because we assimilate them and we accommodate them. So, for example, he argued that we take a scheme, a plan, and we try to see where it fits. And everywhere we find out that that scheme fits, we assimilate that scheme. So a baby is born uh, nursing on a breast or a bottle. And the baby sucks because you you're born with a sucking reflex, and that makes your stomach feel good because you're getting fed. And he argues we notice that whenever we suck something, it makes us feel good. That's a scheme. Then if you ever notice in infants, you'll notice that infants suck and put everything they can in their mouth. According to Piaget, what they are doing is they are seeing where they can assimilate this scheme. And everywhere that this sucking leads to a pleasurable outcome, they assimilate that scheme to use it in that given situation. And that's why babies might like a pacifier. It makes them feel comfortable. Now, he argued sometimes we find out that these schemes uh, don't work. So a child may put something funky in their mouth and it tastes nasty. And they realize that, you know what? They better change that scheme and not use it here. He would call that process accommodation. And then I'm going to talk about later, I talked about it in intro, and I'm going to talk about it in more detail uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, but he argues that human minds evolve through these four distinct stages of reasoning ability. And I don't know if any of you from Psych 150 remember it. Uh, it's the sensory motor, the pre-operational the concrete operational, and the formal operational stage. Uh, it, although it talks about it in Chapter 1, I'm not going to ask you about it in Chapter 1. Instead, we're going to wait until we get to Chapter 5 before I ask you to remember those four stages, okay? They were doing that. They are explain Yes, they are exploring their environment, Leanne, but in exploring their environment, they begin to learn things. And as you learn, you develop mental structures that show you how to interact in your environment. You're really good, Leanne. They are exploring their environment, but you're learning how your environment works. And he argued that's where your first mental abilities come from. Now, we're going to differentiate him with a guy that I didn't mention too much in intro psychology, which is Lev Vygotsky, very, very famous Russian psychologist. And Lev Vygotsky also argued that our minds are going from tabula rasa, from knowing nothing, to full logical behaviors. But where Piaget thought we were scientists studying the world independently, 
Lev Vygotsky focused on the power of social interaction. So Jean Piaget didn't really focus too much or talk too much about social interaction. But those of you who have suffered trying to take an online class where your teacher doesn't teach you anything, realize how difficult it is to learn something on your own. Anybody in here trying to take a math class or a really hard class where your teacher's not giving lectures and you're expected to read the book and figure this stuff out on your own? Don't you know how hard that is? And I'm going to wait for a response. Yes, it's horrible. There you go. PJ would say it's not horrible. Um, but Vygotsky would say, I, that's proving my point, that really the best way to learn is through social interaction where you have a more experienced person guiding a person who is less experienced. And that's really, in my opinion, where the best education comes from. Oh, that's a bummer. So I hate it, Leanne, that you're going to have to learn on own. And so Vygotsky, whereas PJ didn't um, uh, focus on social interaction, Lev Vygotsky realized that, that social interaction is very, very important for learning. And he argued all learning and knowledge is social in nature. And he argued that what happens is people like me, I'm the experienced person here, what I do is I find your zone of proximal development which is the stuff you can easily do all the way up to the stuff that you can't quite do, right? And my job is to meet you in the zone of proximal development and provide hints and help to you or to scaffold your behavior so that you can get better. So you, you, uh, if you're trying to learn how to ride a bike, maybe you can sit on the bike easy enough, but you can't quite ride a two-wheel bike by yourself. So as a parent, my job is to get you on the bike and kind of hold you a little bit as you pedal, right? And as you pedal, I scaffold you so you don't fall over. And as you're riding with me supporting you, your ability gets better. And then after a while, I can take my hands away from you and you can now do something that you couldn't do before. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? And a lot of times what, P what Vygotsky found was sometimes when you ask kids to do something, they can't do it on their own. But if you give them a little bit of a hint, they can do that. So he said, does that mean the kid can't do it? Or does that mean it's just at the top of their zone of proximal development? So we're going to talk about Piaget and Vygotsky over the course of this semester. Now, what I'm probably going to focus more time on what I'm going to focus more time on is what we call the information processing approach. Vygotsky and Piaget did a lot of their work before the invention of computers. But when computers were invented, people said, hey, wow, I'll bet a mind works an awful lot like a computer. And so just like computers receive input, have programming instructions that allow them to process that information and spit out answers for us, they argued human beings do the same thing. So a computer receives input, you encode information. A computer processes information and stores it on a hard drive, you store the information in your long-term memory. And just like a computer spits output out, you retrieve information. So if I ask you who the first president of the United States was, holy cow, suddenly George Washington pops up into your mind, right? You are able to retrieve that information out of your mind. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about a human being as sort of a computer, if you will. And I'm going to talk about encoding, storing, and retrieving information. And more importantly, one of the big changes, not only to human beings, uh, develop the ability to encode, store, and retrieve information. So you're born without the memory, the ability to remember facts. We call this infantile amnesia. Most people don't remember what happened to them before about the age of three or four. And this is a normal thing because your memory banks haven't matured to allow you to store this episodic information. So we're going to talk about how memory develops. But I'm also going to talk about metacognition, which is the ability to monitor, monitor and evaluate your thinking. So you folks know that if you want to remember something, you have to write it down or actually try to remember it. Your knowledge that you have to try to remember something in order to remember it is called metacognition. 
your knowledge that you have to pay attention to me in order to learn something. You can't be watching the TV instead of watching me. Your ability to know that you have to pay attention to something is a metacognitive ability. So the crazy thing is children's memory abilities develop, but their meta-memory abilities develop too. So not only do you learn to remember and retrieve things, but you know how you learn to use your mind most effectively. And we call that metacognition. There you go. You didn't understand chunking. Right. Your knowledge that chunking is the best way to remember things is what I would call a metacognitive strategy. Uh, the knowledge that you need to, to uh, group things into similar uh, groups in order to remember them is called a metacognitive ability. And we're going to talk about that, okay? So that's the cognitive theories of development. Now, do you folks remember behaviorism, operant conditioning, uh, reinforcers and punishers? Does anybody remember classical conditioning, Pavlov's dogs? Okay, now a third way, there you go, Leanne, the Skinner box. The third basic theory, so if you think about it, the, uh, the psychodynamic theory says, really, you can learn most by understanding the conflicts that people have. Good. The second approach, theoretical perspective, says, hey, let's think of people as being computers. The third theoretical approach that we're going to talk about this semester is the behaviorist approach. And the behaviorist approach focuses on how our behavior is shaped by environmental forces, how punishment and reinforcement shape our behavior. I know some of you probably have dogs that you have trained to sit down when you say sit. You've probably trained a dog to shake hands. Hopefully you've trained your dog to poop outside the house and not inside the house, right? If you've done that, you've shaped your animal's behavior using behaviorist principles. And if you remember from section uh, from Psych 150, we talked about operant conditioning, which is where we use reinforcements and punishments. We spank the dog when they poop inside, and we give them a biscuit when they poop outside, and they learn that they need to poop outside, not inside. That's operant conditioning. And then we talked about little Albert and the kid who learned to fear furry white things because every time he saw a white rat, they made a loud noise that scared him. And that's called classical conditioning, which is learning by association. There you go. You're training the husband to do some housework. Absolutely. You know what? If I don't take the garbage out to the, uh, well, actually, now i got kids that do it. But back when my kids were young, if I didn't take the garbage out to the street to get picked up on Monday morning, if I didn't do it on Sunday night, I had to listen to my wife gripe at me all day Monday. So I learned how to take the garbage out so that I didn't have to get argued with, so my wife wouldn't argue with me. You should use the same technique, Etta. And if you want, I can give you some hints, and you can really sort of train your husband. Okay. I know you do, Etta. <laughs> oh, you're so funny. So now we're going to talk about behaviorism, but more importantly, we're going to talk about social cognitive theory. Because not only does the learner change their behavior, but they develop self-beliefs based upon the punishment and the reinforcement. So some of you may have noticed that if you spank your dog too much, not only will your dog not do things, but your dog will, will get uh, kind of nervous, and you might have a neurotic dog. Anybody ever seen a dog that's afraid of other people, right? And so you can develop, sometimes you can use reinforcement and operant, you can use reinforcement and uh, punishment to create a self-belief. Now, behaviors, strict behaviors didn't believe in self-beliefs because that's a mental structure. And true behaviors don't believe in the power of the mind. But social cognitive theory, an offshoot of the behaviorist methodology, believed that human beings develop a sense of power as a function of early conditioning. And he called this belief self-efficacy. So, some of you believe that uh, you are good students and you know you are going to do well in my class or this class. 
Some of you, on the other hand, have low self-efficacy. And you come into my class saying, man, I'm probably going to fail this class. Some of you believe you're good math students. You have high math self-efficacy. Some of you are like me and say, oh, my God, I'm not good at math. I know there's no way I'm going to be able to learn it. Those feelings that you develop based upon your early experiences of reinforcement and punishment are what we call self-efficacy. And we're going to talk about how to develop high self-efficacy in your children. Now, you folks have heard of self-esteem. Self-esteem is different from self-efficacy. Self-esteem is whether or not you like yourself. Self-efficacy is how powerful you think you are. And it turns out that self-efficacy does not predict how well you are going to do in school. Self-efficacy, on the other hand, does predict how well you are going to do in school. So as you're raising your children, yeah, you want them to think well of themselves and have self-esteem. But if you want your children to be successful, you need to help them develop self-esteem efficacy. Okay? Any questions? I know, Leanne, and you know what? The thing is, you're probably not as poor a student as you believe you are. So if you can develop feelings of confidence, Leanne, you can do better in your English class. And remember, you can use uh, Dr. Roddenberry to help support and scaffold you as you develop your English uh, your English skills because you'll notice I have lots of books back here I love to read and I actually could have should have been an English professor instead so if you need help with your book and writing stuff let me help you okay now the fourth approach we're going to talk about is the ethological approach and these are the people that uh, these are the people who uh, look at how animals develop. And these are the people that believe in natural selection and Darwin's theory of natural selection and genetic selection of the fittest. And they try to understand human development by looking at how animals develop. You'll see the picture underneath me is the very famous Conrad Lorenz. Conrad Lorenz discovered this uh, critical period called imprinting. He found that if you uh, were around infant ducks the first couple hours that they were born uh, those ducks would start thinking of you as their parent right and so what he would do is he would hatch these little goslings not ducks goslings actually goose geese and then what he would do is he would be there during the first couple of days of their life and he would show them his face and he would be around them and he found that these goslings attached to him and thought of him as their mothers. And if you Google uh, Conrad Lawrence with a K, K-O-N-R-A-D, oh, Lawrence here, and I had a typo, it's not R, Conrad Lawrence, what he found, you can see lots of pictures of him walking around with a line of ducks following him just like he was their mother. And so um, he understood that animals and human beings have the same biological processes that help them develop. Now, why do goose or geese or why do animals imprint or attach to the first thing that they see? Well, it's because the animal is pretty helpless when they're first born. And by becoming attached and following that bigger animal around, they are more likely to avoid being killed. And so he argued that there's sort of evolutionary forces that drive us to imprint to the first thing we see. Absolutely, Etta, that is Conrad Lorenz, uh, very, very famous, uh, discovering the imprinting of animals. And if you think about it, human babies imprint to the first thing they see. Actually, Conrad Lorenz found that you can even cause ducks to imprint to not inanimate objects like shapes, like triangles and squares. If that's the first thing they see and the only thing they see for the couple first couple of days of their life, when they get scared, they'll run to the red triangle or run to the red square. And it's because there's evolutionary value, there's safety in doing that. It helps the organism survive. Now, we're going to talk about Harry Harlow and attachment theory. If you were in my intro class, you heard me talk about attachment theory. I didn't talk too much about the ethological approach per se, but the idea of human attachment comes down from this ethological approach. And it argues that human beings 
need to attach to a security figure so they can lower their level of arousal and not be scared all the time. You know how babies cry, but when their mother or father's there, they quit crying. He argued that this ar their arousal and their cortisol levels go down, and being relaxed and calm allows the human organism to learn. And we may even talk about attachment disorders later. In, in fact, I know we are going to talk about attachment disorders that occur when you don't have a, an attachment figure early in your life. Okay? Uh, it's really cute to see her with a human as a mom. Really? So the pet squirrel. There you go. That's exactly what I'm talking about, Dee Dee. And the ethologists use animal models to try and figure out because there are th certain things, Harry Harlow did horrible things to monkeys. He separated them from their imp from their moms at birth to see what would happen. You can't do that with humans, uh, but you can do that with monkeys. And so he learned about, he discovered what happened when you separate infant monkeys from their mother at birth. And so we're going to talk about Harry Harlow, and we're going to talk a lot about John Bowlby, and specifically Mary Ainsworth, because she's the one who discovered the three attachment styles that I introduced you to last semester in Psych 150. I know, right? It's horrible what they did. Okay, uh, we're running out of time, so I'm going to finish up with the ecological approach. Now, here's the deal. The psychodynamic approach focused on conflict within your family. Uh, the cognitive approach uh, says that social interaction is helpful, but you're developing these mental abilities. Um, the behavior says it's your environment. But what we have are all these approaches that really don't bring everything together. Think of the ecological approach as the approach that focuses on the entire social system that surrounds your behavior. You don't just grow up with a mom. You grow up with a family. You don't just grow up with a family. You grow up with a culture. You don't just grow up with a culture. You grow up with a nationality, right? So not only am I Chris, son of Bob Roddenberry, but I am Chris, uh, Chris the family man. I am not only Chris the family man, I'm Chris the southern family man. Uh, I'm not only Chris the Southern man, I'm Chris the Caucasian man. I'm not only Chris the Caucasian man, I'm Chris the American, right? I'm not only Chris the American, I'm Chris the human, if you will, right? And so each of these circles uh, fits around me and has an impact on my development. And so we're going to talk uh, probably not as much as the other approaches, but we are going to talk a little bit about ecological theory. And I do want to point to the graph below you, and that's what's known as Bronfenbrenner's ecological theory. He argues that we have these concentric rings around us that affect who we are. Now, in the red circle in the middle, that's who you are and your personality, your sex, your age, your health, and your personality. But around that is what we call a microsystem, which is your home, your family, your school, those people that you interact with every day, every day that help develop you, right? So your mom and your family uh, have impacts on who you are. When you go to school, uh, your school has impacts on who you are. When you grow up in the local neighborhood, all your friends impact who you are. Now, the mesosystem is the connections between the elements of the microsystem. My dad told me that when he was a kid back in the 50s, if you got in trouble at school, they would spank you at school, and then they would take you home so that your parents could spank you too, and then they would bring you back to school. So if you think about it, Whenever you've got notes home from school, your school and your family are working together. He argued that these connections between the elements of the microsystem are what we call the mesosystem. Okay? Now, um, now here's the deal. Not only this uh, um, mesosystem, but really uh, culture and school and families and, and, uh, and your cities have connections between the two of them that don't necessarily impact you. The impact between my school and the state government 
okay, they have interactions, so the state government tells the school what to do, right? The state government told the school that you are going to move to virtual interaction. Now, that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with my behavior because I was bad at school, but those two systems work together, and because they work together, they impact me as the student, and now all students are going to school virtually because these two cultures, these two parts of my culture, interacted together. Bronfen Brenner called that the exosystem. And then he argued that the macro system is the culture at large. Uh, I've had friends from Eastern Europe, and they tell me about how kids do school over in Europe. And it's much different than how they do school here in the United States, which may be much different from how they do school in uh, South America. And these macro systems or cultures really have impacts on how we develop uh, as human beings. Yes, it does appear like a cell, doesn't it, Etta? And then the chronosystem is, uh, he used that to refer to the socio-historical events that affect us. Uh, war, civil upheaval, and even the COVID virus. Okay? Now, oh God, I'm running out of time, so I'm briefly going to talk about the longitudinal approach. Since we're attempting to measure how people change as they get older, what we have to do is come up with different ways of researching other than just doing a straight experiment. And so I'm going to talk to you about the longitudinal approach. One way to study how human beings change is to study them over a period of time. You can visit kids in second grade, visit them in fifth grade, visit them in seventh grade, visit them in ninth grade, and you can see how those children change. That's what we call the longitudinal approach. That's where you look at the same individuals over a period of time. And I have a video in the course resources folder called 7up where they visited these same kids every seven years from the age of seven through 63. And what you can do is you can look to see how they change over a time period. Now, the only problem with this is if you're interested in maturation, how human beings evolve biologically, history uh, effects or things that occur in their environment can cause changes that you weren't really interested in. So I'm not, if I'm not necessarily interested in the COVID virus, but I'm measuring kids two years ago and kids two years from now, uh, the fact that the COVID virus hit is going to affect their development, even though I'm not interested in that. And that problem is what we call a history effect. And sometimes in developmental research, history effects can get in the way of you understanding how maturation occurs. I hope that makes sense. And I'm going to talk about this a lot in a lot of detail tonight in our webinar. Now, so if history is a problem, here's what we could then do. What if instead of measuring the same kids over a long period of time, what if we get uh, go out there and measure some second graders now, some kids who are in seventh grade now, some kids who are in eleventh grade now, and some kids who are twenty four now? This is what we would call the cross sectional approach. The idea being is that the seven year kids in seventh grade used to be in second grade, the kids in eleventh grade used to be in seventh grade, and also used to be in second grade. The twenty four year olds used to be in eleventh grade, used to be in seventh grade and used to be in second grade. This is called a cross-sectional approach and that's where we measure individuals at the same time but we measure individuals of different ages and we figure that they are developing the same way. And so this is another way to measure change across the lifespan. The only problem is that we have cohort effects. The kids who are 24 grew up in a different age than the kids who are seven. And so sometimes Cohort effects or these history effects will affect kids differently. So I grew up and dated and got married before they ever had the cell phone. Crystal, you were talking about how the cell phone has affected dating in your age. Well, you know what? I grew up and got married before that. So if you compare me with you and talk about dating and relationships, you can't say that uh, I represent how you'll be in 12 years. Because what I went through is completely different from what you went through. And that's called a cohort effect. Now, the best way to, to, uh, to look at cohort and, and uh, history effects is to use what the, what's called the cross-sequential effect. And when we, uh, there's a graph right here below me called the Seattle Longitudinal Study of Cognitive Development. What they did was they measured people across the lifespan at different times but they also started with different people at different times. So in 1965, 
they had a bunch of five-year-olds, a bunch of 10-year-olds, a bunch of 15-year-olds, a bunch of 20-year-olds. And then what they do is they measured all those different groups at different times. So now I'm going to measure the 5, 10, 15, and 20 at one time. And then in five years, I'm going to measure those five-year-olds who are now 10-year-olds. Those 10-year-olds are now 15-year-olds. Those 15-year-olds are now 20-year-olds. And those 21-year-olds, 20-year-olds are now 25-year-olds. And this is called a cross-sequential approach. It's kind of like a combination of the longitudinal and the cross-sectional approach. And as we measure human intellectual development, especially in older adulthood, we're going to use the longitudinal, the cross-sectional, and the cross-sequential approach to understand how the mind changes as we get older. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Well, right, and that's the other thing. Davina asks a good question. It also depends on that people develop differently and different paces, like you said. Exactly. And Davina, that's why we don't want to measure just one individual. That's why we don't use the single, the case study, because one person may be different than how the others. Good point, Davina. In fact, if you really want to understand, you need to measure 10 or 15 people, and then you look at the average, how they do, because some people will develop faster, some people will develop slower. What we're looking at is the average. Very good point, Davina. All right, now that's the end of lecture. Remember, for those of you that came in late, uh, next week's lectures are going to be moved to Tuesday and Thursday. We're going to have webinar tonight at 8, and we're going to be talking about cohort effects and how they might relate to longitudinal and cross-sectional designs. I will be logging into uh, Microsoft Teams at 10 minutes to 8 tonight. Bring your favorite beverage with you, uh, coffee or whatever, uh, coffee soda or whatever, and let's spend an hour getting to know each other even more. And I look forward to hearing all of your really intelligent points of uh, view, especially you, Davina. You've had some really good comments today, so I expect you to, to, to uh, bring the heat tonight for me at 8 o'clock. Leanne, I'd love to see you too. Uh, does anybody have any questions? If you don't have any questions, I'm going to go ahead and say goodbye. It's great to see you, and I look forward to seeing you tonight. Take care, folks. Mm -hmm.